they're in the crane family, so it's kind of beautiful that he's here for us. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Cranes, folded cranes. Look at this. as we set the lanterns on the, the pond. Uh, my name is Jeff Napolitano. I'm with the American Friends Service Committee. Um, and uh, this is a little ceremony that we have every year to remember uh, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We've expanded this to not just think about nuclear weapons, but also the issue of nuclear power and, and nuclear technology in general. Um, if you have a cell phone, um, now would be a good time to put it on mute. Actually, that's uh, probably a fine idea. <laughs> yes, all right. Uh, in any case, um, I should note that about an hour ago, uh, some monks from the Leverett Peace Pagoda uh, and a number of brave souls who are walking with them across the state um, set afloat um, similar lanterns, floating lanterns, uh, in Springfield into the Connecticut River. Um, we are here to remember those who perished in Hiroshima and Nagasaki 16, 67 years ago today. Um, and it was, in fact, at this very time, seven minutes ago, uh, in Japan, where it is um, August 6th, that the first bomb, the bomb over Hiroshima, went off. We are also here to remind ourselves and to refresh our commitment to ending the scourge of nuclear weapons and nuclear power. For those of you who wonder why we conflate nuclear power and nuclear weapons, uh, it's because we shouldn't and can't think of these things as, as separate things, as merely you know, scientific differences. There's, there's nothing wrong with chemistry or physics, but the crux of the problem is that nuclear technology is a human technology and prone to mistakes. Uh, the, but the attempt to harness human technology, the, the, the atom, for power and for weapons is so fragile and tentative but explosive and dangerously powerful at the same time that we simply cannot afford to play with it anymore. It has poisoned our air, our soil, our food, and our bodies in extremely brief existence on this planet. And we cannot afford to tinker with it. Whether nuclear technology is used to destroy life overtly and intentionally, as in the bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the tens of thousands of missiles sitting on planes and submarines and in ICBMs across the world, or whether it destroys life more subtly, as in the disasters of Chernobyl, Fukushima, and the quiet and consistent hum of the 400 power plants around the world, this experiment with the atom must end. We are here to remember the damage done and the crimes committed with nuclear weapons, but also to pledge ourselves to do what we can to prevent more damage in the future. So in a moment, we will light these lanterns and we will silently observe them as symbols of our grieving of the past and our work for the future. But before we do so, we will hear from Dr. Henry Rosenberg and now Sukurai. Uh, Henry? Yep. 
Thank you. Thank you for being here. 67 years ago, Thursday, a plane called Boxcar set out to drop an atomic bomb on the city of Kokura. Scientists at Los Alamos were intrigued as to which type of bomb was better. The uranium-based bomb, which had shown its effectiveness three days earlier at Hiroshima, or the plutonium bomb, which was intended for Kokura. As it happened, Kokura was under storm clouds on August 9th. So the crew looked over its list of secondary targets and bombed Nagasaki. No country on Earth has suffered the way Japan has. In the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, between 150,000 and 250,000 people died instantly. The suffering continued for decades as people died of leukemia and other causes. Meanwhile, the Americans continued exploding bombs in a long series of tests. On March 1st, 1954, a 20-mile exclusion zone was announced around a test site in the South Pacific. Weather was unfavorable, but the decision was made to proceed with the test, and to be safe, the observation ships were moved southward. Within seconds of the explosion, it was clear that the bomb was far more powerful than anticipated. The diameter of the resulting cloud was 6.2 miles. A Japanese tuna boat called the Lucky Dragon No. 5 was 40 miles east of the explosion, well outside the announced 20-mile exclusion zone. The ship's crew saw a flash brighter than the sun, and when they raised their hands to protect their eyes, they saw the bones of their fingers. The flash was followed by a shockwave, but everyone held on and survived it. Then white fallout came down like snow, clinging to the crew, to their clothing, and to the ship so that when crew members walked, they left footprints on the deck. During the two weeks that it took to sail back to port in Japan, many of the crew developed acute radiation sickness. They lost their hair, they developed sores, and they vomited. The nine tons of tuna in the hold was unloaded and sold and eaten. The men were hospitalized, and after 14 months, most of them were released, though not necessarily in good health. But the ship's radio man, Aikichi Kubayama, died of respiratory failure. In his last will and testament, he expressed the wish that he be the last person to die from an atomic or hydrogen bomb. After the world saw the horrors of radiation sickness, there was a move to promote the peaceful atom, the use of nuclear fission to make energy too cheap to meter. But things have not worked out as planned. There can always be an unforeseen set of circumstances. At Three Mile Island, it was a stuck valve. At Chernobyl, it was operator error during a high-powered test. And in March of last year in Fukushima, it was an unexpectedly powerful earthquake, which caused a major nuclear accident even before the tsunami that took out the diesel generators needed to supply emergency cooling equipment. For three days, hydrogen explosions <coughs> spewed radiation into the air. A government computer system accurately predicted the spread of the radioactive releases. But the government in Tokyo did not publicize the data. As a result, thousands of residents of a nearby town were led north, believing that the usual winter winds would carry the radiation to the south. They fled with their children directly into the path of the radioactive releases. They prepared rice with contaminated water. Months later, the government released the information that could have prevented much of the exposure to radiation. The day after the tsunami, tellurium-132 was identified in the area of the Fukushima plant. The finding of tellurium-132 is telltale evidence of a nuclear meltdown. 
three months later, the government officially announced that there had been a meltdown. Radioactive elements do not pay attention to international borders. Here in Massachusetts, radiation from Fukushima has been detected in rainwater. That doesn't mean that taking a stroll here on a rainy day will give you cancer. But it is a statistical certainty that there will be cases of cancer caused by the increase in background radiation caused by the Fukushima disaster. And we are gathered here 35 miles from Vermont Yankee, a reactor identical to most of the Fukushima reactors. Vermont Yankee leaks tritium from pipes that the management initially said did not exist. It has released strontium-90 in at least four separate years. And the management claims that the strontium-90 recently found in a fish in the Connecticut River was not their strontium-90. <laughs> you have repeatedly heard comparisons between radiation release from a nuclear plant and medical exposure from a chest x-ray or a CAT scan. But there is more than one kind of radiation. Alpha rays can be stopped by your shirt or by a piece of paper. But once an alpha emitter is ingested, say by eating contaminated food, it is meaningless to compare the exposure to that from an, uh, an X-ray study. Once the source of radiation lodges in bone, it can directly irradiate bone marrow or lung for years. It isn't clear what we ought to do about the huge pool of so-called spent fuel at Vermont Yankee, a quantity of radiation much greater than um, what is at Fukushima. But the first step is clear. We must stop creating more spent fuel and adding to that pool. We must shut Vermont Yankee down. coming here. I think important things have been already said. I don't have anything to add. I'm more interested in listening, listening to the stories of victims, listening to the stories of Fukushima children, listening to the stories of children in North Korea who are suffering from flood right now. I would like to extend our prayer tonight to also children and women and people in Syria. I'm here today to remember what happened in Fukushima. And also, even though I wasn't born when it happened, I would like to continue uh, keep telling the stories of what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but I also would like to remember the true history, including tragedy and lies Japanese government made. I would like to remember all the history, the true history. So. Thanks for coming. Thanks for speaking.